Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com, both free sites. It is April the 15th, 2019, late at night, about to turn April the 16th. Let's talk boxing. But first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, one of the things I've learned in life is that you need to run your life like a hedge fund, right? There are many bets you make that you're going to lose. But the big winners, where you make three times your money, four times your money, five times your money, subsidize everything else, right? That's whether you're betting on sports or whether you're playing in the markets. Now, let me just say, there are some fights that I see where I understand I've made a mistake, where I wouldn't make that bet again, right? Errol Spence, Mikey Garcia. I took Garcia in that fight. I'm biased toward underdogs. I believe that's where markets in boxing misprice the outcome the most. So I took Mikey Garcia, but I wasn't expecting to see. Not just the Errol Spence jab, but the foot speed gap between the two fighters. Right? I question whether Mikey Garcia over 12 rounds in a rematch would be able to get past Errol Spence's jab. It didn't seem to me like Mikey had a lot of answers. If they announced a rematch in that fight, I would say, look, I was wrong the first time, I'm staying away. But there's a flip side to that, and people need to realize it. Right? I was wrong on the Clarissa Shields Christina Hammer fight. No question about it. Right? Clarissa Shields won that fight on my scorecard. She dominated the second half of the fight. She made the adjustments. She won big. But that fight I feel differently about. I feel that Christina Hammer could have done some things differently. I felt that fight had an element of surprise. I'll give you another fight that had an element of surprise, right? Classic fight most boxing fans have seen, right? And that's the rumble in the jungle. Ali Foreman, only time they fought. Ali Ropadope's Foreman, right? He wins that fight. Foreman hits the canvas in that fight, right? I'm not saying Ali didn't win it. Quite frankly, Ali banked some rounds with his back up against the ropes. But you get the feeling that if the guys fought again and if Foreman contemplated the idea that Ali might use a strategy where his back up, where his back's up against the ropes and he has Foreman punch himself out, you get the feeling that Foreman might have been able to make some adjustments that that fight the second time around, to quote Shalimar, for the old timers out there, right, that fight could have played out differently. So, Shields is boss, I'm not here to say differently, right, but if they announce a rematch, and if Hammer were to show me that she understands certain things. The idea that she can't lead all the time. The idea that she should circle away from Shields's counter right hand which hits her with regularity. Right? If Hammer plays it differently too, uses her legs more to stay away from Shields during the slow rounds at the risk of having not a lot of action take place in the fight. I could easily see where that fight leads to a different outcome. So let's just talk philosophy here because I, I was reading the comments to the earlier videos and uh, I realize a lot of you just don't know my betting philosophy in general. Right? I can tell too I have some conservative types who don't pop out until 
a favorite wins a fight. Right? So that they can then tell me anybody with two eyes could have figured out that Clarissa Shields would always beat Hammer. Okay, fine. I understand there's some conservatives out there. But it's my basic thesis. In fact, I know this is true from years of watching sports. That if a better team or a better fighter faces a not as good team or fighter, there's going to be a set of outcomes if they were to fight 10 times where the underdog wins some of the fights. In other words, maybe a Mike Tyson beats a Buster Douglas 7 out of 10 fights. But there are going to be 3 out of the 10 fights where Tyson loses. And then you're going to have to look at the odds. Tyson was favored by some huge number, something like more than 30 to 1. And you're going to have to say to yourself, well, wow, if Douglas wins 2 or 3 out of 10, isn't the value there on the Douglas side of the play? So let me just name some bets right now that haven't made it to my boxing page here on YouTube that I'm looking at, that I've bet on, right? NBA playoffs. Just to understand, I think the best team I've seen in a long time are the Golden State Warriors. I have a futures play on Golden State to win it all. Right? I believe I got less than the minus 200 that's going around now. But I also have a play at much higher odds. Remember, 3x, 4x, 5x. Much higher odds. Futures. On the Houston Rockets. Right? If Golden State plays Houston in the second round of the playoffs, I believe there is a chance that Houston pulls the upset. Now understand, if that happens, and if I'm in the world of not 3x, 4x, or 5x, if I'm in the world of 10x, 15x, then if Houston beats the Rockets, excuse me, if Houston beats Golden State, in the second round of this year's NBA playoffs, then I can give away some of the profits and hedge the play. Right? If you had Tiger going into the last few holes of the Masters, and if you got 10 to 1, 14 to 1 is what the big winner got in Vegas, you could have then just spent some of those expected winnings on his opposition. So had Tiger collapsed, you would have protected your profit. Understand, if Houston beats Golden State, the odds are so skewed that you're already in the green. You can then bet against Houston going forward if they ever play a team that you feel they're at risk of losing to. Right? People on my other channel here where I do sports on YouTube know that I thought the San Antonio Spurs had a shot on Denver. Right? Guess what? San Antonio went into Denver and beat Denver the first game of that series. So the odds have shifted now. Understand right now, before game two, you could lock in a profit there. Because you took the underdog, the odds have shifted, now you could take Denver and whoever wins the series. You're banking dollars. Right? So, let's talk about a fight that's coming up. Look, I myself believe that Terence Crawford is one of the absolute best fighters in boxing. Right? In terms of reliability, I myself believe that Terence Crawford is far more reliable, far more reliable than Amir Khan. But understand, as I make this video, Right, Khan was going off earlier 
at better than a plus 700. In other words, better than 7 to 1. Right? Just understand, Khan has in his corner one of boxing's best trainers. Andre Ward's trainer. Virgil Hunter. I'm not kidding when I say I was watching Khan against Canelo. Let's pick one of the biggest names in boxing today. And I did not give Canelo a round in that fight until the knockout. Now, Khan used to train with Freddie Roach. Understand, Khan used to spar with Manny Pacquiao, another big Roach student. Freddie Roach has seen Amir Khan in the ring with very tough opposition. Opposition that quite frankly is faster in terms of hand speed and foot speed. A better athlete than Terence Crawford. Right now there's an article from yesterday on BoxingScene.com. The name of the article is interesting. Right? It's Roach. Colon. Amir Khan has bad habits. Crawford will knock him out. Now that's the name of the article. But understand you can't go by headlines. Right? So what I want to encourage people to do, especially folks who are serious about gambling, when presented with a plus 675 underdog, is to actually read the article. And what I want folks to realize is that Freddie Roach was in Victor Postal's corner when Postal got destroyed by Terence Crawford. Right? So Freddie Roach has experience with both fighters. And in the article, Freddie Roach tells you all you need to know to place a bet on the Crawford Amir Khan fight. Right? He says in the article, Terence Crawford is a good fighter. Amir has better speed and footwork. But he has to put them together and be at his best. He has to win every round one at a time. But I believe Ramir will be knocked out somewhere along the way because he has bad habits. You want to know what his bad habit is, according to Freddie Roach? Roach says he has all the skill in the world and he has, all, he has a lot of speed. But at some point, he will go for the knockout. And when he does that, he gets himself in harm's way and gets knocked out. Right, folks? You're looking for a live underdog who, if his plan A works, if the fight comes down to hand speed and foot speed and boxing ability, understand his former trainer, the trainer of Pacquiao, the trainer of Cotto, the trainer of Postal, believes that if a boxing match breaks out in this Crawford Khan matchup, Khan has the advantage. Think about that. The casino is giving you a plus 675. Now understand, Roach even points out in the article, get past the title, that in all the fights in which Amir Khan's been knocked out, he's been ahead. That's the Danny Garcia fight. That's the Saul Alvarez fight I'm talking about. So at a plus 675, the odds right now as I make this video, you can take Khan to win. I know that's anathema to the very conservative, I told you so after the fact, gamblers. Right? I understand it. 
They see Crawford, they say, wow, unbeaten, one of the best pound for pound. I don't even want to consider any other outcome but a Crawford victory. But what I want people to know is using Freddie Roach's math, you can take both sides of the play. You could take the guy with the better hand speed, the better foot speed, the better boxing ability, at a plus 675. Plus 675. And you can hedge the play with Crawford by KO. Now understand, the Freddie Roach article came out yesterday, well after my pre fight video. Right? Well after my pre fight video. But that's the hedge I recommended in my pre fight video. Let me also say this too. I want people to revisit Amir Khan against Devin Alexander. That's Khan over 12 rounds owning an excellent fighter. Alexander, you might remember, beat Marcus Maidana. You remember back in the day, the hoopla over who would win unbeaten Devin Alexander or unbeaten Timothy Bradley. Right? Well, let's think it through. Devin Alexander ran into the boxing version of Amir Khan. And he lost badly. I mean badly. Right? Amir Khan fought Paulie Malinaji. At the time, Malinaji had one of the best jabs in boxing. Malinaji was a very slick fighter. Khan fights him in New York City. Folks, as you look at the tape of that fight, you understood that here was Khan in against an excellent boxer. Out boxing Pauli Malinaji in Pauli Malinaji's backyard. Right? So the point I'm making to you is, look, this is the high risk part of the net. Just understand, the Christina Hammer pick, and she went off at something like a plus 250 or something like that, wasn't the only plus 200 pick I had that night. I also had Caleb Truax against Peter Quillen. I had multiple plus 200 picks going. Now the Truax-Quillen fight ended on a headbutt, no decision. Right? Okay, fine. But understand, you need to follow the value in bets. Because as good as Terrence Crawford is, Understand, there's a scenario where Amir Khan wins the fight outright. I'll even go further. Life would be different if you believe Khan beats Crawford three out of ten times. Well, there wouldn't be a lot of value in Khan at, let's say, three to one. Right? Wouldn't be a lot of value. But what about Khan at 6.75 to 1, where you're getting him right here. Let's also do the math on betting. Understand, if you win this fight, it's going to water a lot of plants. You're getting a 6.75 to 1 payoff. Let's talk about the hedge. Let's say Crawford deconstructs Khan, right? It's going to take him a while. Understand, Canelo never deconstructs Khan. Never. He ends that fight on a right hand, right? Canelo's a puncher. He knocks Khan out. As long as that fight was about movement and boxing, Canelo was in trouble. Let's go further. You've seen Canelo against Golovkin, right? 
People should know here. I took Golovkin in both fights against Canelo. I would take Golovkin in a third fight against Canelo. Right? You saw Canelo against Golovkin. Even though I myself think Golovkin won both fights against Canelo, I don't think Golovkin had as good a stretch against Canelo as Amir Khan did. The Sammy Vargas fight. Understand, Khan had a different trainer in his corner, Joe Goosen, because Virgil Hunter was unavailable. Well, Virgil Hunter is back in Khan's corner. Right? Virgil Hunter is a guy who brings a three-dimensional defensive concept to his fighters. Right? They're moving around the ring. Khan's not going to set up a lemonade stand in the pocket and try to sell the fight to the judges there. He's going to be moving around the ring. If he gets full of himself, and I believe Khan is full of himself, and decides he's going to collapse the pocket like he did against Danny Garcia. If he gets knocked out, you're covered by the Crawford by stoppage hedge. Right? So, if you're looking for a live underdog, don't believe me. Believe Freddie Roach, who used to train Amir Khan. Khan has the better speed hand speed and foot speed. Right? Think about it. Khan's the better boxer. Now it's true. Khan at times engages in risky go for the knockout strategies that cost him. Khan at times has defensive lapses. How much more flush could Canelo have hit him? But understand, if Khan starts the fight and stays the course, you're not looking at a plus 675 underdog. If he messes up like the Danny Garcia fight and gets KO'd, all right, we'll live with that because he will have won on the hedge. Let me also add a couple more comments. Jaime Munguia. Right now in my community page here on YouTube, there's the question who really won the fight? Munguia or Dennis Hogan? More than 70% of you, more than 70% of you believe Dennis Hogan won that fight. What's important here is that as you look at the fight, and it's in my favorites folder, as is the Clarissa Shields Christina Hammer fight. As you look at that fight, you're going to notice that Mungia, who's young, he's something like 22, has no idea, has absolutely no idea about defense as he backs away from the pocket. Folks, he's naked. Right? He's up close. He's the bigger man. He's up close. He's in the pocket. As he backs away, I believe, defensively blessed fighters would just know you're there. They develop habits. You want to talk about bad habits. Defensively blessed fighters develop habits where as they back away from the corner, they're leaning away from a possible punch. They have a hand up. They turn away. Right? Or they might snap their head back to make sure that just in case you throw a punch that's outside their line of vision, they know you're there. Right? Munguia doesn't have any of those gifts. This is the second fight in a row where I've seen Munguia just backing away, get hit flush, repeatedly. Here it's glaring because the opponent's shorter than him. 
It's not even a big opponent with a long reach. And the opponent knows that as Munguia backs away, he's vulnerable to get hit. Now Munguia claims that it's because of the weight. He really can't make 154 anymore in a healthy manner. So he's calling out Saul Alvarez. Right? Oscar De La Hoya is involved with both fighters. The minute that Saul Alvarez Munguia fight is made, or the minute another guy is calling out, the Golovkin Munguia fight is made, run to the casino and take Canelo or take Golovkin. Right? Canelo already beat Amir Khan throwing a right hand when Khan had his hand down. You have a puncher like Canelo and keep in mind Munguia would have to gain weight to get to 160. You have a puncher like Canelo against a guy with defensive lapses like this and Canelo's just gonna wait for Munguia to back away from the pocket. He's gonna be open. He's going to look like David Hay looked against Tony Bellew, right? Has all the defense in the world coming forward. You notice has no defense coming backward, right? An opponent who figures that out is going to have a field day. Let's also talk about Vasyl Lomachenko. You know, Vasyl Lomachenko is like a DB a defensive back in the NFL who's also a boxer you know he's fighting Anthony Kralla who moves well Kralla's a stylish he's he's a stylist who moves very well and Lomachenko is moving with him to the point where you would think Lomachenko who is on him better than Krala's shorts. You would think Lomachenko's Deion Sanders. The footwork is dazzling. Right? Just contrast Lomachenko's footwork with Deontay Wilder's. Right? Wilder crosses his feet. Wilder's a little bit out of position. Lomachenko every second is ready to throw punches. Never crosses his feet. It's even more breathtaking when you realize that Loma could switch just like Crawford could switch. And his feet still are flawless. Right? Let me just say too. I talk about guys who've been in car crashes. You want to see what a car crash looks like? Look at the ending of the Lomachenko Kralla fight. It's in my favorites folder. Right? Was Kralla hit by a punch? Or has he been in a car crash? When he rolls over on the canvas, you notice his nose is bleeding. You notice the guy doesn't look like he's able to walk on his own a full 25 seconds after he's gotten off the canvas. Right? Dazzling performance. But let me say this about Lomachenko. Here's where you make your money. Jorge Linares did put him down. Because understand, Loma likes to get close to you. I mentioned Deontay Wilder earlier. Understand, Wilder always has a cushion between you and him. Right? Wilder relies on power shots from distance, something I call ring coverage. Loma's so close to you that he gets put down by Jorge Linares. Right? Loma needs to be close to the pocket, doesn't he? So here's where it gets interesting. You do have some heavy punchers out there. Gravante Davis comes to mind. I understand different promotional group. 
you know, maybe the guys never make it into the ring. But I need to have people consider the fact that while Loma is brilliant, and while Loma has beaten some huge punchers, made them quit, Loma has also gone through long stretches of fights, granted, against elite competition. Right, Linares? The first, I don't know, nine, ten rounds of that fight? Very competitive. Pedraza. Right? I don't care how the judges saw the fight. I'm just telling you that fight was highly competitive until the ending. Loma wins both fights. I'm not saying otherwise. But understand there is a certain level of fighter who can be competitive against Vasyl Lomachenko. And Lomachenko's style is such that he needs to be up on you like your shorts. Right? Just food for thought. So, let me just close by saying, yes, in this video, I'm suggesting that two of boxing's absolute best fighters pound for pound, Terence Crawford and Vasyl Lomachenko, are not unbeatable. I know it's upset some people here. I, <laughs> I know it's upset some people here that I've mentioned the Orlando Salido fight where Loma is forced onto his back foot and things are different. Right? Don't fall in love with overwhelming favorites even when they are pound for pound among boxing's elite. Right? The important thing with the Freddie Roach article isn't that Freddie thinks that Amir Khan's a blockhead who's going to give up his advantages and get himself knocked out? No, it's the admission by Freddie Roach that against one of the sport's best fighters pound for pound, a man who beat Freddie Roach's Victor Postal, Amir Khan has the better hand speed the better footwork, <laughs> think about it, the better boxing ability. Right? When you hear that from a superstar trainer who's no longer working with the fighter, and when you look at the odds at your casino and you're seeing a plus 675, <laughs> my point to you is you know where the value lies. That American Crawford fight, I, I might well be on here after the fight saying Crawford won the fight. Right? As I was after the Spence fight. As I was after the Clarissa Shields fight. But the point is, that's where the value is. That's your chance to make more than six times your money. With the easy hedge. The if Amir Khan is a blockhead in this fight hedge. Of Crawford by stoppage. That's how I see it. Understand the risk involved. If the fight goes to a decision and Crawford, who is unbeaten, wins the decision, you lose it all. Folks, this is gambling. There's big risk involved. You've been warned. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.